and welcome to Pharmacology for PA students. Today we'll be talking about adrenergic antagonists. Adrenergic antagonists are also called adrenergic blockers or sympatholytics um, because they block the sympathetic nervous system output or decrease sympathetic nervous system stimulation. Adrenergic antagonists bind to adrenergic receptors without stimulating a response. And when they're bound, they prevent the binding of an agonist. So they're preventing stimulation or activation of the receptor. Thus, in doing so, they decrease sympathetic stimulation. Adrenergic antagonists are classified according to their relative affinity for alpha receptors or beta receptors. So we have alpha adrenergic antagonists, or they're more commonly called alpha blockers. We have beta adrenergic antagonists, or they're more commonly called beta blockers. Um, the alpha blocking agents include drugs like doxazosin, prazosin, and terazosin. Um, these are used, again, primarily for cardiovascular conditions like hypertension. The list that you see right down here, um, alfuzosin, silodosin, and tamsulosin, which is a commonly one used, um, these are used for BPH, not for cardiovascular conditions. And the reason for this is that these um, are specific for alpha-1A receptors. And alpha-1A receptors are found in the bladder and in the prostate. So um, in this case, we cause relaxation of the bladder and the prostate, and this increases um, urinary flow or decreases that, he that hesitancy and decreases the weak stream that we see associated with BPH. And because these agents are specific for alpha-1A receptors, they're associated with a decrease in cardiovascular side effects. that we would see with non-selective agents. Alpha-1 blockade in particular causes vasodilation. And so it's associated with a decrease in vascular tone or a decrease in peripheral resistance. And associated with that then is a decrease in blood pressure. So they're used for hypertension. Um, because of this decrease in blood pressure, they can be associated with a reflex tachycardia. That's the body's natural response to a, a um, decrease in blood pressure is to increase the heart rate in order to keep up with cardiac output. But we'll talk about that more later. Um, one other thing that alpha blocking agents are really associated with is causing orthostatic hypotension Um, or it's also called postural hypotension. And what this is, is um, when the patient changes position, so when they stand up quickly, um, it's associated with um, a, an extreme drop in, in pressure and blood flow to the brain, which causes syncope right, or fainting. In a normal body, when you stand up like that, the vessels, especially in the legs, um, but the vessels constrict, and that's to fight the pull of gravity and keep the blood flowing so that you have plenty of blood flow to the brain. Well, when you have alpha blocking agents, that prevents that normal vasoconstriction. So that slows or decreases the blood flow to the brain and the blood tends to stay or pool down in the legs. When there's not enough blood flow to the brain, the body's response is to faint, right? Because then you change position and no longer is gravity an issue, and that increases the blood flow to the brain. Um, so alpha blocking agents are associated with this postural hypotension, and because of that, um, the dizziness and possible syncope or fainting. Um, again, alpha-1 blocking agents um, or alpha-1 blockade, blocking of the alpha-1 receptor, is what we, what we utilize for cardiovascular conditions. 
alpha-2 blockers are limited in their usefulness. Um, there is a drug called yohimbine. Um, yohimbine is an alpha-2 blocker. It works in the central nervous system to decrease, um, or sorry, it works in the central nervous system um, and it was used as a sexual stimulant and actually increases sympathetic outflow. So it works in the CNS to increase sympathetic outflow. And again, it was used as a sexual stimulant in erectile dysfunction, um, but we don't use it clinically anymore. There really wasn't any um, proof of efficacy. So clinical use, um, Clinical use is declined. We don't use that anymore. But just in case you hear of it or, or see it somewhere, that's what it is. We're really going to focus on alpha-1 blockers, though. Um, Beta-blocking agents like atenolol and parvitolol, metoprolol, propranolol, there's a lot of them. They are utilized also for cardiovascular conditions and um, a large one of those is hypertension, so we do utilize them to decrease blood pressure. But blocking beta receptors does not affect vascular tone. Um, blocking beta receptors, specifically on the heart, decreases heart rate and decreases contractility, and that's how we decrease blood pressure with beta blocking agents. Because we're not binding to alpha receptors and not decreasing vascular tone, um, these do not cause postural hypotension or orthostatic hypotension, like we saw with the alpha blockers. Beta blocking agents can be classified as selective beta blockers and non-selective beta blockers. Selective agents block only beta-1 receptors, which are found on the heart. Non-selective agents block both beta-1 and beta-2 receptors. Remember that beta-2 receptors are found in the lungs. Um, beta-2 receptors are the receptors that are stimulated for bronchodilation. So blocking these um, beta-2 receptors can lead to bronchoconstriction, which obviously is going to be a major issue in people who have pulmonary conditions like asthma or COPD. Um, so we'll talk more about the importance of selective versus non-selective in a little bit. Beta blocking agents have numerous cardiovascular uses like hypertension or heart failure. Um, they're also utilized in glaucoma to decrease intraocular pressure. Uh, there are other uses as well like migraine prevention, um, which we'll talk about. We'll get into all of the specifics in a minute. Most of the alpha blockers that we use clinically are selective alpha blockers. They're selective for alpha-1 receptors. Um, these two drugs that you see here, however, are non-selective alpha blockers, um, and they've got very specific uses. Phenoxybenzamine um, is, again, a non-selective alpha blocker, so it blocks alpha-1 and alpha-2 receptors. And it's used to treat hypertension in very specific situations. Um, it's used to treat hypertension that's associated with pheochromocytoma. Um, pheochromocytoma is a tumor of the adrenal gland. And this specific tumor happens to secrete catecholamines. Um, so increased release of norepinephrine, epinephrine from the adrenal, um, the adrenal gland. Remember that the adrenal medulla has sympathetic innervation, and the adrenal medulla makes epinephrine and norepinephrine and releases them into the bloodstream. Um, Pheochromocytoma is when there is a catechol catecholamine secreting tumor present in the adrenal gland. So it's associated with a large increase in circulating catecholamines. Um, so blocking, um, blocking catecholamine receptors or alpha receptors is beneficial in decreasing the effects of that tumor. Adverse drug effects of phenoxybenzamine 
include postural hypotension. Again, for the same reason we mentioned before, um, you block constriction of the vessels when you stand up. So there's a, um, a hypotensive response that occurs there. Um, nasal stuffiness because of the dilation of the vessels in the nasal mucosa. Um, remember, the drugs that we use for nasal stuffiness cause constriction of those vessels. So blocking the constriction of those vessels would have the opposite effect. It would cause nasal stuffiness. Nausea and vomiting, um, inhibition of ejaculation can occur, and then reflex tachycardia, which we mentioned. Um, but because of the drop in blood pressure, the body's response to that is to then increase heart rate. So it's associated with reflex tachycardia. We see that with a lot of these. Um, phentolamine, phentolamine is also a non-selective alpha blocker, and it is also used for um, diagnosis and then short-term management of theochromocytoma for the same, in the same reason, same way. Phentolamine is also used in um, hypertensive crisis that occurs when there's abrupt clonidine discontinuation. Remember, clonidine should be stopped slowly. Um, and if clonidine is stopped abruptly and a hypertensive crisis occurs, phentolamine can be used to block the alpha receptors that are present in the meantime. Also, um, when tyramine-containing foods are given with MAOIs, um, tyramine causes an increased rate of release of catecholamines. Okay, so tyramine increases the release of catecholamines. And normally it's okay in most people. Um, tyramine is metabolized by monoamine oxidase. And normally um, in most people, the monoamine oxidase metabolizes the tyramine. It doesn't build up and be fine. However, people who are taking MAOIs or monoamine oxidase inhibitors have the, are, are unable to metabolize that tyramine and the tyramine builds up. Um, in that case, there's a large release of catecholamines and that can um, result in hypertensive crisis. So phentolamine is another, or phentolamine can also be used in that situation. Prazosin, terazosin, and doxazosin are selective alpha blockers. They block um, primarily alpha-1 receptors. Uh, doxazosin is the longest acting of these, um, and these alpha-1 blockers are used for hypertension but they're used in combination with other drugs. They're not used as monotherapy. There just happen to be other drugs that are superior and have better outcomes, um, so these should not be used alone. Typically, they get added on to improve the response once another drug's been maximized. The other drug, if you've maximized dose, you're getting the best response out of that drug that you could possibly get. Um, you can't increase the dose, but you still need to lower the blood pressure at that point, you would add on um, an alpha-1 blocker. The way that these um, drugs work is by binding to alpha-1 receptors in the, the vasculature and preventing vasoconstriction. So they decrease vascular tone, decrease vascular resistance, and that ends up decreasing blood pressure. This has minimal effects on actual cardiac output. The, um, these alpha-1 blockers are used, again, to treat hypertension, but only in combination with other drugs. They do happen to be associated with a modest improvement in lipid profile and glucose metabolism. So that's something to keep in the back of your mind if you're deciding which drug to add on. Um, if you're going to do dual therapy and you need to decide which drug to add, and the person happens to have um, you know, high cholesterol, which frequently patients will, um, these might have a, a modest benefit there. Adverse drug effects of the alpha-1 blockers include something called the first dose effect. Um, <clears throat> with the first dose effect, there's a, a, a rather big exaggerated orthostatic hypotension um, with the first dose that's given. So 
this is it's pretty extreme in some cases and it has been associated with syncope or fainting so it's best to avoid this first dose effect and you can do that by starting with a third of the dose quarter third but a third of the dose is fine um, and then increasing it over the next couple days so give a third and then two thirds and then the full dose and then also dosing this HS, um, QHS is at bedtime. Okay, so when you give it at bedtime, the person is, uh, they're laying down, right? They're already horizontal. So you're not relying on that vasoconstriction. You're preventing that orthostatic hypotension um, for the first, you know, whatever, eight hours or so that they have the medication in them. And this tends to decrease the chances of that first dose effect. The alpha-1 blockers are associated with dizziness because of the, this, what we're talking about, the orthostatic hypotension. Um, even if it's if there's not actual syncope, there can be some dizziness. Um, so patients should be told to just get up slowly. Don't jump right up out of bed slowly and wait and sit up and give it a second and then slowly stand up. Um, and that should help to decrease some of that. Headache and sexual dysfunction are also possible. Another thing to um, keep in mind is that there's an increased response to these alpha blockers when patients are also on vasodilators. Um, vasodilators include things like nitrates, nitrates like, sorry, nitroglycerin, or PDE5, it's phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors. Like sildenafil. Um, sildenafil is Viagra. So something to keep in mind if patients are on nitrates or they take PD-5 inhibitors um, is that you can have an increased effect when they're combined. So the drug should be titrated really slowly. The dose should be really slowly increased until you get to that effective dose and the patient should be given the lowest dose possible. Um, also, counseling patients is important because with both of these drugs, nitroglycerin and the PDE-5 inhibitors, the person's not necessarily taking them regularly every single day. So they need to be aware that if they do take these or they plan to take these, that they're going to have a greater response to their alpha blocker. So they need to be cautioned about that. Now we'll change gears and talk about beta blockers or beta blocking agents. Um, beta blockers competitively antagonize beta receptors. So they bind to beta receptors and they prevent agonist binding. So they prevent activation of that beta receptor. Beta blockers can be non-selective or selective. Um, non-selective agents bind and antagonize both beta-1 and beta-2 receptors. Selective agents um, bind and antagonize only beta-1 receptors. Um, because the beta-1 receptors are the receptors that are found on the heart, we often refer to these as cardio-selective. I think they're selecting the beta receptors that are in the heart. Uses of beta-blocking agents um, include lots of cardiac uses, so hypertension, angina, arrhythmias, um, post-MI or myocardial infarction, heart failure. We use them in hyperthyroidism to decrease that sympathetic stimulation that occurs in hyperthyroidism. Um, they're used to decrease intraocular pressure in glaucoma and also for migraine prevention. When we're talking about um, blood pressure, we'll see that beta blockers have the ability to decrease blood pressure without causing postural hypotension. Because they are not affecting the alpha receptors that are located on the peripheral vasculature. 
In a second, we'll look at specific beta blocking agents like atenolol, metoprolol, propranolol, carvedilol, um, and you'll see that all of them end in olol, right? So ol, ol, except for there are two agents that are a little bit different. Labetalol, labetalol is labetalol, so that's a l o l, and then carvedilol is i l o l. But they still sound the same, right? So they all sound very similar. We'll start by talking about propranolol. Propranolol is like the kind of classic non selective beta blocker. Um, non selective, so again, it blocks beta 1 receptors, which are found in the heart, but it also blocks beta 2 receptors um, that we find in the lungs. Um, because it blocks both of these, it can actually block the effects of epinephrine and anaphylaxis. Okay, so during anaphylaxis, epi binds to beta-2 receptors and causes bronchodilation. This can block those beta-2 receptors, so it can block those effects, um, which is one of the ways that we see that this is non-selective. Um, Propranolol has a, a relatively short half-life compared to some of the other non-selective agents. Um, propranolol has a half-life of about four to six hours, which is pretty short. Um, some of the other agents like natalol, natalol is another non-selective um, agent that has a half-life of like 24 hours. Propranolol though does have um, ER formulations. So if there are extended release formulations available um, to decrease the number of doses that have to be taken in a day and then increase compliance. Um, <clears throat> propranolol and other non-selective agents um, can be used for hypertension. This makes sense if you think about blocking beta-1 receptors in the heart. It has negative inotropic and chronotropic effects. So the heart beats slower, right? That's the chronotropic effect. It decreases heart rate. And then inotropic means that it decreases contractility. So by decreasing both of these, ultimately it decreases cardiac output. And decreasing cardiac output can decrease blood pressure. Um, this is the primary way that the non-selective beta blockers work. They do also decrease renin release and sympathetic outflow. So that would in turn also decrease blood pressure. Initially, propranolol is associated with um, reflex vasoconstriction. That initial decrease in cardiac output, the body reacts by causing vasoconstriction, but that does dissipate in time. The body, the receptors get downregulated and that goes away. And ultimately both um, systolic and diastolic pressure are decreased. Now, because this has negative chronotropic effects, because it's decreasing the heart rate, it can be associated with bradycardia. And bradycardia is actually the thing that typically limits the dose of propranolol. Um, <clears throat> Non-selective agents like propranolol can also be used for chronic stable angina. Um, Chronic stable angina is chest pain, uh, and the chest pain occurs because the heart gets ischemic. Right? The heart is working really hard, and there's not enough blood flow going to it to, to fuel it, and so it's ischemic, and that's painful, causes angina, chest pain. The way that propranolol works with chronic stable angina is when it's decreasing the, um, the workload of the heart, the heart beats slower, and it contracts less, right, less forcefully. So the heart's working less, so it has decreased oxygen consumption. Um, <clears throat> so this is good for an ischemic heart. In an ischemic heart, when you decrease oxygen consumption, you relieve that ischemia. So it will decrease chest pain on exertion that we see with angina. Because propranolol, um, blocks those beta receptors, the beta-1 receptors on the heart, it directly de depresses SA node and AV node conduction. 
So it slows conduction of the action potential in the sinoatrial node and in the atrioventricular node. Um, because of that, it can be used for supraventricular arrhythmias, arrhythmias that, that are generated above the ventricle. <clears throat> it is not effective in ventricular arrhythmias. Propranolol is also used post-MI um, or myocardial infarction. Um, it has a protective effect on the heart to prevent a second MI or a second myocardial infarction when used prophylactically. post first MI. So when you use prophylactically post first MI. Um, the thing here though is that a drug called metoprolol, metoprolol, which is a selective agent, a selective beta blocker, is also used um, post MI prophylactically to prevent a second MI. Um, and being that metoprolol is a selective agent, selective agents are typically associated with fewer side effects. Um, so metoprolol may be kind of replacing propranolol in this case. Also administration of a beta blocker immediately following the MI has been shown to reduce infarct size and mortality. Um, this might be because it's decreasing the workload of the heart. So it's decreasing oxygen demand. And again, the heart is already infarcting. The heart is already ischemic. So decreasing that oxygen demand can decrease the spread of that infarction um, or the size of that infarction. Uh, Propranolol has been shown to decrease the incidence of um, sudden arrhythmic death after an MI. So it, it is protective to give post-MI. Propranolol is one of the more effective beta blockers for migraine prevention. Um, it's used prophylactically to prevent migraines. Um, so when taken on a daily basis, it reduces the number of migraine episodes. So it's not used to treat a migraine. Um, it's not, you don't take it once you feel a migraine coming on, you take it daily to decrease the number of migraine episodes or migraines that you have. When we're actually treating migraines, we typically use serotonin agonists, um, sumatriptan, the triptans are drugs that we commonly use to actually treat a migraine. But propranolol is good for um, decreasing or preventing migraines. Um, the reason propranolol is, is one of the more effective beta blockers for this is because it's lipophilic. And its lipophilicity allows it to have good CNS penetration. Um, finally, propranolol is also used um, in hyperthyroidism. Hyperthyroidism is associated with an, a really big sympathetic stimulation or a large sympathetic response. Hence, with hyperthyroidism, there's typically um, high blood pressure associated from that, that sympathetic stimulation. So beta blockers help to blunt that sympathetic stimulation. And they can be life-saving when given during thyroid storm, um, thyroid storm or acute hyperthyroidism. And the reason for this is that they protect against arrhythmias. Beta blockers are associated with um, quite a few side effects. 
And this is something important to counsel patients about so that they're aware of them. Um, and then they're less likely to be non-compliant if they at least know what to expect and know how to try to avoid them or minimize them. Um, Propranolol, because it's a non-selective beta blocker, is associated with even more side effects than the selective agents. Um, bronchoconstriction is a really important one. Because propranolol is non-selective and because it blocks beta-2 receptors, it's associated with bronchoconstriction. Remember, beta-2 receptors, um, when stimulated, cause bronchodilation. So blocking that um, prevents that and, and can be associated with bronchoconstriction instead. Beta, um, non-selective beta blockers like propranolol have been associated with death by asphyxiation um, in asthmatic patients who are inadvertently given the drug. So this is highly important. Um, to make sure that you're not giving propranolol to patients who also have asthma or COPD. We have other agents that can be used. Selective agents um, can typically be used safely. So there is no reason to give a non-selective beta blocker to somebody who has asthma or COPD. Um, propranolol has been associated with arrhythmias, um, and not just arrhythmias, it can be hypertension, so worsening hypertension or worsening angina, and then more severely arrhythmias upon abrupt withdrawal. So um, propranolol and other agents should never be withdrawn abruptly. They need to be tapered down slowly over at least a few weeks. Uh, the reason for this is that while the beta blocker is being taken, the cell's response is an upregulation of receptors. So then once the beta blocker is taken away, there's all these beta receptors present and um, a huge sympathetic response occurs. So it's important to slowly take away that beta blocker so that the receptors can slowly um, acclimate to that. Propranolol has also been associated with sexual dysfunction in men. Um, and don't really know why this is. Um, ejaculation is mediated by alpha receptors, not beta receptors, but sexual dysfunction has been reported um, enough for us to warn about it so that you can be aware of it. Um, beta blockers or propranolol um, is associated with fasting hypoglycemia and then also a diminished response to that hypoglycemia. So most of the signs that will kind of tell you, man, my, my sugar is low, will go away. You don't actually see those. So you lose some of the warning signs of hypoglycemia. The reason for this is that it decreases glucagon release which when sugar is low, glucagon is the hormone that's released in order to increase sugar. So you um, decrease glucagon and decreased glycogenolysis. Glycogenolysis. Glycogen is how we store sugar, right? So tons of sugar molecules linked together, um, tons of glucose molecules linked together. And glycogenolysis is when we go lyse that glycogen, we go break off the sugar. So both of these things are responses to low blood sugar, to hypoglycemia. This is how the body responds to fix the situation. Um, propranolol can be associated with the inability to respond to that. And this can be dangerous, especially in patients who are taking insulin. Um, <clears throat> so it's something to caution patients who are receiving, in, or use caution in patients who are receiving insulin. Also, the response to hypoglycemia is mediated by catecholamines. Um, <clears throat> so this is blocked by beta blockers. Typically when we have hypoglycemia, the patient will kind of be aware of that because of the tremors, tachycardia, nervousness occurs. All of that is blocked. The one thing that is not blocked, the one um, kind of sign of hypoglycemia that's not blocked is diaphoresis. So diaphoresis, sweating,
is not blocked. That will still occur due to the hypoglycemia. Um, propranolol, beta, other non-selective beta blockers, can be associated with an increase in triglycerides and decreased HDL. HDL is like the good cholesterol. So this is, um, it's bad for the lipid profile, increasing triglycerides and decreasing HDL. The reason for this is that beta receptors are involved in um, lipolysis or, or breaking down of triglycerides into free fatty acids. That mobilizes the energy reserves and then we can use those free fatty acids. Well, blocking the beta receptor blocks this. So we can't break down and use those free fatty acids. Instead, we have a buildup of triglycerides. Um, so it increases triglycerides. Selective beta blockers may have less of this effect. So in a patient who um, has hypercholesterolemia or some sort of um, atherosclerosis or some problem with lipid profile, um, <clears throat> giving a selective agent like metoprolol, for example. Selective agents less of the um, problem with the lipid profile. Finally, um, beta blockers can be associated with central nervous system disturbances. Um, this can be things like depression or lethargy. Lethargy and fatigue are very common with beta blockers especially in the beginning of um, use when we first start them. Um, other CNS stuff like vivid dreams can occur. This is less with hydrophilic agents. So less CNS side effects with hydrophilic. Atenolol. A tan um, happens to be hydrophilic and it's also selective. So that's kind of, that's two benefits there. The lethargy and fatigue is not just a CNS disturbance though. Um, lethargy and fatigue occur initially with beta blockers because of the decrease in cardiac output. That decrease in cardiac output can make people feel like, ugh, like they just don't have the energy. And it's important to warn patients about that because patients will get started on them and then they'll be like, I feel like crap. I feel so much better before I started taking this and they'll stop. Um, but if you warn them about it, that gets better. It doesn't stay like that. There's actually improvements um, in the way that they feel and in their you know, exercise tolerance and there's, there's improvements. It's just, they kind of have to make it through that first phase. So if you warn them about that, they know Otherwise, they don't know and they think that the drug just makes them feel terrible and that it's not helping, that it's just making things worse. Beta blockers are also used for glaucoma. Um, they work by decreasing the production of aqueous humor. So decreasing the production of aqueous humor results in a decrease in intraocular pressure, which is what we want in glaucoma. Um, and the beautiful thing is they do not affect the ability to focus for near vision. They do not affect the ability to change pupil size in differing lights uh, like the cholinergic drugs do. So um, <clears throat> they don't have those extra associated side effects. Onset is about 30 minutes after the drops are given and they last for between 12 and 24 hours. So they're pretty user friendly, um, especially again, compared to the cholinergic drugs. Timolol, which is really commonly used, um, cardiolol and levobunolol block both beta-1 and beta-2 receptors, they're non-selective. Metaxolol is selective, it blocks beta-1 receptors. These are given intraocularly, so again, via eye drops, and like I said, they decrease the production of aqueous humor to decrease intraocular pressure. The beta blockers are used for chronic management of glaucoma. They're not used in emergency situations. Um, the drug of choice for emergency lowering of intraocular pressure is still pilocarpine. Here you see some selective beta, beta blockers. Again, we say that they are cardio selective.
because they're selective for beta-1 receptors that are located on the heart. Um, drugs include atenolol, metoprolol, esmolol, which we'll talk about is only used in very specific situations, um, nabivolol, bisoprolol, atenolol, and metoprolol are really commonly used. Um, these are used for hypertension. Um, they lower blood pressure, again, by decreasing, um, by decreasing heart rate and contractility. So they lower blood pressure, they reduce oxygen demand on the heart. And they do this without the bronchoconstriction or much less risk of bronchoconstriction. That's problematic um, in patients with pulmonary comorbid comorbidities. They also tend to have less of an effect on lipid profile and carbohydrate metabolism, um, which is another benefit. They are also less likely to be associated with something called Renan phenomenon. Um, that's at the really cold extremities. Selective agents have less of that initial peripheral vasoconstriction, that reflexive constriction that happens with the non-selective agents. Um, so they have less of this Raynaud phenomenon as well. So in general, um, selective agents are typically associated with fewer side effects than the non-selective agents, but they still have the benefits um, of being, you know, decreasing cardiac output, decreasing blood pressure, decreasing oxygen consumption of the heart. Um, CNS side effects still apply. However, they're decreased with drugs like, again, we said atenolol has fewer CNS side effects. So selective beta blockers are used for hypertension. Um, they're also first-line therapy for chronic stable angina. We talked about that on the last slide um, or a couple slides ago, but that's because they decrease the workload and oxygen consumption of the heart. Um, bisoprolol and extended release metoprolol are approved for chronic heart failure. Um, we don't use beta blockers in acute heart failure, um, only in chronic heart failure. Esmolol has a really short half-life. Esmolol has a half-life of like 10 minutes. So um, we give it IV and it's utilized to control hypertension or rhythm in critically ill or surgical patients. It slows AV conduction, um, just like we saw. Show, oh, goodness, excuse me, just like we saw with propranolol, um, and both of them are used for supraventricular arrhythmias. Oops, sorry. or um, tachycardia, for example, supraventricular tachycardia as well, to be specific. Um, nabivolol. Nabivolol has a really long half-life. Um, another kind of standout feature of nabivolol is that it causes the release of nitric oxide. And nitric oxide causes vasodilation. Vasodilation would further decrease blood pressure, so it's kind of a, a, an additional effect. Libetalol and carvedilol um, are odd. They are mixed antagonists. They block beta-1 and beta-2 receptors, and they also block alpha-1 receptors. So they work on both alpha and beta receptors. You can remember that these are the two that, that do that, that are different, because look at the spelling of them. Remember I said most of the, um, most of the beta blockers end in O-L-O-L. O -L -O -L. These are the weird ones. So labetalol is A-L-O-L, carvedilol is I-L-O-L. These are the ones that don't just block beta, they also block alpha. They're used for hypertension and heart failure. Um, Libetalol is used in pregnancy-induced hypertension. We'll talk about this later, but methyl dopa 
is another drug that's also used in pregnancy-induced hypertension. Um, labetalol is also given IV in hypertensive emergencies. Carvedilol is used for chronic uh, stable heart failure. Um, remember we just said that bisoprolol and metoprolol and metoprolol are also used in chronic heart failure. Those are specific um, beta-1 blockers. Note, we do not use beta blockers in acute exacerbations of heart failure. Again, only chronic stable heart failure. Um, the way that these work in heart failure, heart failure has this, this cycle of um, there's not enough blood being pumped to the body. So there's this big sympathetic response that makes the heart work harder. The heart works harder and that damages the heart even more, decreases the pumping efficiency. Then there's not enough cardiac output, so there's more sympathetic response. And there's this cycle of not enough blood, work harder, damage yourself more, right? And then not enough blood, work harder, damage yourself more. So this stops that cycle. Um, <clears throat> so the heart stops trying to work harder and harder and harder. So it stops damaging itself more and more and more. We'll finish up with a couple questions to try and apply some of this information to short little cases. So a 60-year-old patient is started on a new antihypertensive medication. His blood pressure is well controlled, but he complains of fatigue, drowsiness, and dizziness or fainting when he gets up from bed. Which of the following is he most likely taking? Fatigue, drowsiness, that could really be anything. Um, but the dizziness or fainting when he gets up from bed gives it away, right? That's orthostatic hypotension or postural hypotension. And we know that that happens with alpha blockers, right? The alpha-1 blockers. So let's look at our choices. Metoprolol, no. Metoprolol is a selective beta blocker. It works on the heart, not the vessels. Uh, Propranolol, no. Propranolol is a non-selective beta blocker. Still, it works on the heart, um, not the vessels. Does not work on alpha receptors, so no. Prazosin, Prazosin sounds good to me. Um, that's an alpha blocker, so I think that that's gonna be my choice, but let's just look at the last one. Alfuzosin, hmm, that's an alpha blocker, but if I remember correctly, that's a selective one, right? Isn't that an alpha 1A? blocker. And remember, those are um, used for BPH. Those are in the bladder of the prostate. So this drug is used for BPH. It does not have the same cardiac effects that um, prazosin and terazosin have. So prazosin is likely the drug that he's been taking. Um, if this happened only the first time he took it, that was probably his first dose of it. If this happens regularly, um, we can counsel him as far as, you know, being careful when he gets up from bed, getting up slowly. We could adjust the dose or we could change the medication to something that does not cause orthostatic hypotension. Also, remember, these should not be used alone. So technically, he is probably taking um, multiple drugs because they should not be used as monotherapy. But prazosin is the one that's causing that orthostatic hypotension. Okay, so our last question. A 30-year-old male was brought to the ER with amphetamine overdose. He presented with high blood pressure and arrhythmias. Which drug is most appropriate to treat all the cardiovascular symptoms of overdose in this patient? So if we're gonna know how to treat all of the symptoms or all of the things that are happening, we need to know what amphetamine does. And if you look in the little notes section of this PowerPoint, I gave you guys a hint telling you that amphetamine increases the release of norepinephrine from sympathetic neurons. So if we're increasing norepinephrine, then we're increasing um, the binding to all different types of adrenergic receptors, right? So we're worried about alpha receptors and beta receptors being stimulated. So if we wanna block that, we need to pick a drug that's going to block both alpha receptors and beta receptors. So let's look at our choices. Metoprolol, Olol, right? That's a beta blocker. 
prazosin, we just saw prazosin, so metoprolol is beta. Prazosin is an alpha blocker. Labetalol, this is one of the weird ones, right? Labetalol is not O-L-O-L. -O -L. It has the A there, right? Labetalol and carvedilol, those are the strange ones that block both beta and alpha receptors. So that one looks good. Let's keep looking. Um, nabivalol, nope, that's O-L-O-L. -L. That must be a beta blocker. So the drug that would block all of the cardiovascular effects of amphetamine would be labetalol. That would be a good choice to give um, the patient who's overdosing from amphetamine. All right, guys, that is it for adrenergic blockers. Um, next reset, or next lecture, or next receptor. Next lecture, we will start to go into um, drugs that affect other types of receptors. Um, specifically to treat neurological conditions, degenerative neurological conditions. Thank you.